Thank you very much uh, for showing the video. And also uh, you saw at the end uh, the pictures of all the different um, uh, institutions that are part of water mining. It's now my pleasure to give the floor to uh, Professor uh, Lois Sidhu uh, to, to, to present her presentation on case study in Cyprus. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm going to talk about the case study for, as you call it, in water mining project, the Larnaca project, where we have a West water treatment plant and urban mining. I am Professor Maria Loisidou uh, from NTUA, but also from Silo as well. These are the teams where we, they, we work together for this case study. It's the National Technical University of Athens on the left, up left. Right is Maria, the Maria, we cannot see your slides. Uh, sorry. You cannot see my slides? No. <coughs> How comes? Um, if you try, uh, maybe uh, refresh the page and then share again, then that may work. We try now. Maybe you should switch on your camera. Yeah, okay. We can see your slides now. Yeah. You can see Thank now? You. Yes, we can see. Thank you. Perfect. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Put it on full presentation. Yes. Yes, perfect. now it's full, I think. Now we yes, are yes, about perfect. the four teams. Uh, probably I have to go from the beginning. The Larnaca project, uh, the wastewater treatment plant, the urban mining. Uh, I am Maria Loisid, we can hear it about me. Um, here are the teams. Uh, the National Technical University up left, uh, up also right is Larnaca Swedish Board, uh, right down, left down is Wedgus and Uricat, um, right, and um, also Matisse and Silo. Where is Cyprus? Probably some people were wondering why Cyprus is the very, very east to the, for the European Union. So you see the circle there, as here is Cyprus, and the, the rest of the partners are throughout Europe. Uh, as Cyprus is a small island, 1,000 1, people, uh, but uh, we consume quite a lot of water. And we, we have to reuse water, so we bring it to the context of water so th there is no shortage. We have to treat the wastewater, the wastewater from all the sewage ports. And Larnaca is our case study. It produces about uh, 3.5 million cubic meters per year and also sludge, uh, 5,000 cubic meters per year. So both are used for agricultural purposes. But why do we bring this case study into our program, the water mining project? The problem is that uh, after the tertiary treatment of wastewater treatment plant, we still have sodium. Um, and chlorides and uh, mainly a high electrical conductivity in the water. So we have to remove these problems uh, from using the our water mining technologies uh, in order to be able to reuse water for, uh, for irrigation and agriculture. We use up to now, but there are problems with the, the farmers. So the objective of the pilot is to recover phosphate, though the phosphate is within the limits, we want to recover phosphate to store fouling, but also we recover water to feed purpose, we recover sodium chloride for internal recycling and chlorination in the plant, and also we have the concept of zero liquid discharge. Uh, how, which are the steps of this case study? Initial design was already performed, a bench scale tests have already performed. The final design has already performed. And we are now implementing the project already in Cyprus. So some of the systems have arrived and a few more are arriving next, uh, next week. And then we are going to work with case study. Two things about the flow diagram. I'm not going to go into the detail. We receive from the Larnaca wastewater treatment plant effluent that, as I mentioned, is, is goes tertiary treatment through membranes and chlorination. We use the biofree technology to remove phosphorus, which can be used as a fertilizer for agricultural purposes. And then the water after biofree goes through the nanofiltration. And the purpose of nanofiltration is to separate the divalent from the monovalent ions. 
the divalidions go down uh, and they are taken to a low, to a low uh, temperature evaporator to recover salts for industrial purposes, while the, the permeate goes to the reverse osmosis to get water out of this, but also to get the monovalent ions such as sodium chloride and sodium Sorry about this. It's a very sensitive screen. And um, after the multi-effect distillation, we go to a crystallizer to get the sodium chloride salt for industrial case application, but also to use it inside the Larnaca plant uh, to get uh, chlorine instead of getting chlorine from outside. Our aim is to recover more than 95% of water and sodium chloride purity more than 90% and phosphorus concentration less than between 10 and 40 parts per billion. And the whole system is a zero liquid discharge and to recover water, very good quality water for agriculture and also for other purposes. And just to show you the system, uh, they are all containerized on my left. I show the NF, the nanofiltration, the reverse osmosis systems. Also, both pictures. The upper one is the nanofiltration, and then the lower is the reverse osmosis system. This is the MED uh, evaporator and crystallizer. The evaporator is here, and the crystallizer is here. It's already both are in a containerized form. It's a two effect uh, MED evaporator and the, which we design and built, and the crystallizer is from the market. The bio-free system has been designed by uh, Wetsus. It's already in Cyprus. You can see the container here, where we try to remove phosphate. It's all everything automatic. And here we get the, the people that they are trained to do the, the job. But apart from the technical part of the work, we have the community practice meeting, and uh, Gonzalo will say more about this, explain the main goals of the project, especially the case study four, explain the mission of COP, establish the COP, explain and discuss with the stakeholders their role, discuss and validate with stakeholders the value-sensitive design and the market matching. Already in Cyprus, we had the first meeting, which was extremely um, successful. We had all sewerage ports of Cyprus, Lima, Solamathuni, Kosia, Paphos, and etc. We have the end users, the agricultural association, and the farmers, the forestry department, but also we had the policy makers because now they want to find the solution for the Cyprus problem. And what we realized during the meeting that other uh, wastewater treatment uh, plants have the similar problem of salinity because we are in coastal areas and there is intrusion of, um, of seawater into the system. This is a picture of the meeting. This is me talking to that meeting. And thank you very much for, the, for this, for that, um, listening to me. I hope I was short. So. Thank you very much, Maria. That uh, was very uh, good uh, to see how you are trying to do this in Cyprus. Short question from my side. Is there um, anything why in Cyprus people feel so uh, so so motivated to do this? Yes, I said probably you hear me, I mentioned at the beginning that, uh, uh, that we have a, a shortage of water in Cyprus and we need to use every drop. So wastewater treated the, well, the wastewater has to be recycled and reused. So we have to remove any constituents that they prevent from this activity. And the salinity was one of the problems and that's why water mining is trying to give a solution. And I think we will be successful because already we have good results for that. Wow, that is excellent to hear. Everybody who wants to ask questions to Maria, please put so in the question and answer, and then we will return to them later. And it's now uh, my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Philip Wilford, and he will talk about the next case study in water mining, an urban case study. <clears throat> yes, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Philip Wilford. Uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, Patricia. 
I will tell you in the next seven minutes something about our work on uh, extraction of Comair and radar gum. And uh, let's jump right into it. For the um, Comera Nareda gum, first of all, we need to know a little bit what Nareda wastewater treatment plants are. Um, that's a wastewater treatment strategy uh, invented by TU Delft and then further developed in a private public uh, partnership together with Stowa, the Dutch water authorities, and the uh, Royal Haskoning DHV. And today, roughly 90% of the wastewater, uh, 90%, 90 wastewater treatment plants all over the world are uh, operated with this process. And the basic principle is actually the, that you have aerobic uh, granular sludge. And that looks at the end uh, like something like that. So in normal wastewater treatment plants, you have a more flocculent sludge type, which is very small and settles very uh, slow. And settling is an important uh, part of wastewater treatment. And if it takes longer, you need dedicated tanks for it. Longer retention time needs more space. Whereas these granules uh, that you can see here, they settle actually quite quick. And on top of that, you have many different uh, microbes in one granule, whereas in a normal wastewater treatment plant, you need several tanks for that. So you can uh, already imagine using this technology, you end up with much smaller wastewater treatment plants. What you can see here on the image is the wastewater treatment plant in uh, Groningen. And this red part is the old plant and the blue part is the new um, Nareda wastewater treatment plant and both have the same capacity. And um, yeah, the status quo of this Nareda plant is uh, it does a very good job in treating the wastewater. As you saw, it has a very low physical uh, footprint and that results also in low uh, operation cost and it's very easy to, to operate these plants. But uh, there's one drawback, like all other treatment plants at the moment, uh, there's limited recovery of nutrients, for instance, phosphorus and, and nitrogen, but also of you mainly uh, recover low value carbon products. So what I indicated here is the, let's say, usual pathway of wastewater treatment. You have a tank where the wastewater is treated and you have the granular sludge, it ends up in an anaerobic digester and you produce biogas um, by methanogens and then you get a relatively low uh, value, C value product, carbon product that's biogas. And most of your phosphorus and nitrogen is actually lost with the sludge, which is usually either incinerated, but in uh, some few countries also brought to, to agriculture. And what we envisage uh, in the water mining process, uh, project is that we actually keep this uh, wastewater treatment plant as a basis to, with using an radar process. But we would like to recover carbon and it's a high value product and also nitrogen and phosphorus. And that means that the sludge will not go to a digester, but that we recover Calmera. And I will tell you in a minute what that is. And also digest the sludge, not at neutral pH, but at a high pH at alkaline conditions, which uh, generates a pure methane stream. So instead of a low value carbon product, you get two high value products. And at the end of the day, we would like to work on uh, nutrient recovery that we cover phosphorus and nitrogen, which can then be reused, for instance, in agriculture. And uh, yeah, the Chimera Nareda gum, well, you get it out of these granules, which are the heart of the Nareda treatment process. And you can imagine it's something that the bacteria, which are inside these granules, excrete, and it acts like a bioglue. So it's actually a biopolymer that the, the bacteria excrete to, to be able to form these glues to stick together because otherwise they are washed out in this uh, Nareda treatment process. And this Chimera is a biopolymer. Yeah, it's of course uh, fully uh, biodegradable. It comes from a, um, from a waste source. So it's, it's uh, CO2 neutral and uh, um, very sustainable, of course. 
that's how you look uh, how it looks when you get it from the wastewater treatment sludge uh, process and it has different applications so for instance it has been shown that it can uh, it can have a positive effect on the growth of uh, roots but it can also be used as a composite to stimulate um, and to substitute oil derived uh, composites for instance and then it can a building material can be made out of it but Camera has also some unique features. For instance, it showed that it is flame retarding. So it, it can be used as a composite. And at the same time, it brings in some new uh, properties. For instance, these, these blades could be flame retarding at the end of the day. And just a quick uh, overview how the Camera is extracted. So you start with these granules. You put them in a tank. You add a KOH to increase the pH. You increase the temperature. And then this chimera goes in solution. You do a solid uh, liquid separation using a decanter. You end up with a waste pellet that you uh, don't need anymore for the chimera because the chimera is in solution and goes with the centrate to a second tank. Here you add an, an acid, for instance, uh, HCl. You decrease the temperature with a heat exchanger, you decrease the pH, and at these conditions, Calmera precipitates. And you do again a solid liquid separation, and this time your pellet or your solid material is the Calmera. And uh, for us, this alkaline waste pellet is not a, a waste. For us, uh, we would like to do something with it, and we use special microorganisms that can produce under this uh, high pH conditions, uh, methane. They occur naturally in soda lakes in Russia. We use that as an inoculum to produce uh, green gas. Because at this pH, CO2 stays in solution and only methane goes to the gas phase. So you get a very pure methane stream. And we would also like to recover somewhere in this process nitrogen and phosphorus you see that there are really huge differences in temperature and pH. So we would like to make use of that and recover other nutrients as well. And how we do that, we're currently investigating with master students at uh, TU Delft, but also we have a PhD student that we have together with uh, Vetsus in uh, Leowarden. And you can imagine that this upper part is uh, basically set. So there are two pilot installations in the Netherlands, one in Ape and Zutphen, which already extract Calmera from um, dairy wastewater sludge but, and municipal wastewater sludge. So that works. And in water mining, we just shrink that in containerized units. And the, the bottom part, we are doing research at TU Delft together with our partners in the water mining project. And that we try to integrate over the next four years into this established camera extraction process. And uh, the status where we are at the moment, so we have uh, finalized the 3D drawings of our pilot uh, recently. It's now under the assembly and next year in March, we test our installation in, in Utrecht in the Netherlands, and then we bring it over to Faro in Portugal to operate it there for six more months to extract Calmera from their sewage sludge. And what I would like you to take home is that in uh, water mining, we, uh, we, make a, we build a containerized uh, installation to extract Calmera from, from uh, granular sludge. We bring this on the road and we test it on different locations in, in Europe. We start in Utrecht, continue in Faro, and maybe also somewhere else to show the community of uh, the wastewater treatment people, okay, this stuff works also at different sites and also to produce significant amounts of Calmera that we can investigate um, um, over time. And on the bench scale, more research oriented fundamental research, we work on uh, developing technologies to recover methane, phosphorus and nitrogen from the sludge. And uh, with this, I'm at the end. I'm happy to receive questions. And uh, on the bottom, you can see our partners here the, in our project. That's Aquas de Valgaf, Royal Hascon, DHV, Vetsus, Lentec, and Axiona from Spain. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much, uh, Philip, for your presentation. And it's nice to see that these uh, containers that also Professor Loisy Du is using in Cyprus uh, can also be uh, traveling over Europe and perhaps even uh, outside this project. So if you have a question about that, don't hesitate to ask that. I uh, quickly move on to our next speaker, which is Ellen Tuinman from Rotterdam. Ellen, the floor is yours. Hello, hello. I will also share my screen. Hopefully you can see it now. So my name is uh, Ellen Tuinman. I'm a lead engineer for the ACCH plant at, uh, at Hexion. Um, and we will be hosting uh, a case study as well um, at our Pernis site. Uh, and it's focused on industrial mining. We're an industrial company. Um, so many industries are looking for ways to, to close the loop in their processes and move to a circular economy. Um, and we're no different. Uh, so Hexion and in this case study also together with, uh, with Nobion, who is also a partner in the water mining project, we are looking to close the loop on, uh, on salt and on water. Um, so the challenge here is, again, big numbers, how to reuse 3 million cubic meters of wastewater. Uh, and in our case, wastewater that contains salts, which can be of value, of course, um, but also organics coming from our processes. Um, which we would rather remove. Uh, currently, this wastewater goes to the Shell Biotreater. Um, this is not an actual picture of the Biotreater. Uh, it, it is not that salty. Um, so our streams vary in concentrations from uh, 4 to 12% in sodium chloride. And we have other streams that are up to 4% uh, calcium chloride. Um, so we're trying to see what we can do with this. Um, and the idea is that this wastewater can be mined, hence also the name water mining, uh, to recover brine uh, and hopefully recover brine that is actually suitable for electrolysis. And this is also why uh, Nobion is also a partner in this project um, because at Hexion, we actually receive chlorine and caustic from Nobion's chloralkali plant, which is nearby. I think it's six kilometers away from us. Um, we use this chlorine and, and the caustic in our, in our processes to construct the molecules that we uh, want to sell to our customers. Um, but the molecules that we make don't actually contain the chlorine. So it's, it's used in our processes, but it doesn't end up in the end product. Uh, and actually 65% uh, of the chlorine ends up in our wastewater as salts. Um, so this is our brine. Um, but it is contaminated with organics also coming from our processes. Um, now, if the brine would be pure enough, it could actually be fed back into electrolysis. Um, Nobion applies membrane electrolysis normally to uh, salt water brine, um, which they make from uh, salt that they mine in the north of the Netherlands. Um, and you have to imagine this is a very cost intensive, electricity intensive, um, a sensitive process. So any organics here uh, could build up on the membranes, causing efficiency losses or even delamination of the membranes, um, which would be high replacement costs. Or if it doesn't build up on the membrane, the organics could go into the various products coming out of this process. So it's very sensitive and very vital that if we want to bring it back to electrolysis, that we can remove the organics uh, that are normally in our wastewater. Um, so the technique that we want to use for that is high pressure oxidation. This was uh, developed by uh, an engineering firm in Austria called KVT. Uh, that is their waste brine process. Um, and they actually um, convert the organics in our wastewater uh, or in any wastewater to uh, CO2 and water. So it's broken down um, by using oxygen at a high pressure and a high temperature. They have tested our brine, uh, both on lab scale and on bench scale um, size, and they have shown that they can bring our brine down from the 2000 ppm total organic carbon that it usually contains to, uh, to less than five ppm total organic carbon. And this should make it attractive for application of electrolysis. Um, now, the brine usually contains, in our case, mostly glycerin and a bit of solvent. 
um, and it looks to be uh, quite easily broken down with the HPO process. Here you see the proposed uh, treatment train. So we take some of the wastewater from our collection vessel and we lead it to, um, in some cases, a concentration unit, an MED. Um, but I'd like to focus for this presentation on the HPO. Um, there we condition the brine, bring it to a lower pH, uh, a catalyst is added, a metal catalyst, and then the brine is pressurized and heated uh, and brought into contact with oxygen. Uh, as I said, the organics are then converted to, to CO2. There's also a bit of CO and some excess uh, oxygen. Um, and then the next step is to remove this metal catalyst because that is also something that we definitely do not want to go uh, bring to um, membrane electrolysis. Uh, the, the, the specs on that are even stricter. Uh, so in two stages, this catalyst is, is recovered, first um, via a um, candle filter, and then as a last step, it passes an ion exchange resin to remove the final bits of catalyst. Um, in this demonstration, we aim to sample the brine for, for Nobion, for them to be able to do application tests with it. Um, but in the demonstration, most of the brine will actually be recycled. Uh, via the normal route uh, and go to the shell biotreater. Um, we've selected a location for this demo at our site. Uh, this little uh, yellow uh, square here, this is currently uh, a plant that is being demolished. So after the demolition is gone, uh, done, then we have to sp uh, spot free for the demonstration. Um, this is a 3D model of what the um, unit will look like. So it's one container and one open frame with um, the high pressure oxidation column. The oxygen, uh, see, the oxygen will be fed in this case with uh, coming from bottles. We have here some IBCs for the various filter aids, um, demi water, HCL for the regeneration of the ion exchange resin. Um, yeah, what we want to do here is really to optimize the operating parameters. Um, we want to see if we can maintain a good quality, uh, also looking at the TOC and the catalyst. We want to, as I said, sample for Nobium. Um, and the overall aim of this demonstration is to show that um, the brine that we make here, when we compare it to brine that is mined uh, and normally used, uh, in the electrolysis process at Nobion, that we can show a 70% water reduction. Uh, there's a lot of water usage in the solution mining of the salt, and then this is evaporated, it is transported from the north of the Netherlands to Rotterdam, then it is again dissolved, uh, so again water is used. Uh, so here we think we can make a reduction of 70% water uh, by using this brine from industrial processes. Um, we aim to show that we can get 90% of the brine within specification. Um, and we also want to demonstrate that we're using waste heat. Uh, I did not specify it earlier, but this actual process taking place in the high pressure oxidation column is, is exothermal. So the heat that is um, generated by breaking down the organics is actually recovered to heat the new incoming brine. So there's a lot of um, the use of waste heat as well. Um, so this, in short, is the, the case study in Rotterdam. Um, as I said, on the Nobion side, less water for solution mining and salt dissolving. And on our side at Hexion, uh, less wastewater discharge to the surface water and a recycle loop around the sodium chloride molecule in different forms. So in the caustic, in the chlorine and in the in the salt form. That was it. Thank you very much, uh, Eden, for your presentation. It uh, shows uh, really that it makes sense to try these things out if you can save so much water and uh, make a circular process um, for that. But uh, but we don't get there only with technology, and that is why we also have invited Gonzalo because we know that uh, society doesn't really. Uh, just like that, except our technology, we need to implement it in society and therefore we also need to look at all sorts of different things 
uh, relating from market models, policy models, sustainability, and uh, and also, therefore, using um, stakeholder uh, methodologies to invite and engage and uh, discuss with stakeholders what they think is the best solution. So, uh, Gonzalo, the floor is yours to present what we do. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia. I'm Gonzalo Gamboa, from the researcher from the Autonomous University of Barcelona. And we are in charge of a... Uh, uh, leading the work package on social engagement. So I will present you the process of social engagement on how to in incorporate uh, social values and te technological development. This work has been done uh, together with Mar, Mar Palmeros from TU Delft. We have been working from the case study with the different uh, uh, cases, from the work package with the different case studies and other work packages. Uh, so, uh, what is value-sensitive design? The aim of this uh, value-sensitive design process is to incorporate social values into emerging technologies, in this case, in, into water mining technologies. So we do so, uh, well, this, uh, the, these technologies or emerging technologies uh, often are developed in processes that are blind to the context and also to the stakeholder reality. So, the idea is to incorporate these social values in the process of technological development. Uh, to do so, we base our work on the so-called communities of practice. Uh, a community of practice is a group of people that share uh, interest and they want to learn from each other and uh, exchange experience and knowledge. Uh, so it is a community of actors that develop joint activities, discussion and learnings. We had the first COP meeting in the different case studies last uh, September, October. Uh, there is a shared domain of interest, in this case, the water mining technology, and they uh, develop a process of uh, social process of, of continuous interaction. So we have planned at least one uh, meeting per year, but some communities of practices or some case studies are planning more every six months or, or so the, the, the meetings to, to get together all the stakeholders. Uh, so the process uh, has three stages. The first one is the value identification. Uh, we identify values from society. Uh, we identify uh, tensions of values and then uh, based on these values we do some design propositions and develop some indicators to evaluate the case studies the technologies but we do some we make some design proposition uh, i will explain later on so this first uh, stage is the setting the scene then there is a in the second year we are planning to do a value sensitive optimizations uh, in which we uh, explore opportunities and barriers of the different technologies based on the values from society. And then at the end, third year, we, we plan uh, to do an outlook for implementation and concerns. And this, uh, we will carry out a full scale implementation study. So the first part is the work done this first year. We have done an iterative process of meeting with uh, case study partners and interviews with the uh, stakeholders. Then we meet again with the case study partners to feedback you know, about the values identify, uh, then we identified uh, social values and value tensions. We did a third meeting with the case study partners and we uh, did some uh, design propositions discussing with the case study partners. And at, as I said before, in September, October, we had the first COP meeting of the six case studies in which we present the advances of the, this process to the stakeholders and we get some feedback from the stakeholders. In the second stage, we will review during this year stakeholders' feedback and to hold a new round of meeting with a case study partners to do the value-sensitive optimization, trying to incorporate the values of the different stakeholders and translate them into uh, design propositions. And at the end, uh, we will do an analysis of real-scale implementation. This is the whole process of the value-sensitive design. So just to share with you some pre preliminary outcomes, these are some transversal issues that has been arising 
uh, from the discussion with the stakeholders and also with the discussion with the case study partners. Just some outcomes, just to see, uh, to give you an example of the sort of uh, uh, propositions. Uh, I have to say that the process is aimed at incorporating values and making design propositions, but most of the times, there are also propose, proposals for different pu uh, public policies in, the te in terms of uh, water management. So, for instance, a very interesting discussion that has been arising in different case study is the ownership. You now, people is asking about the ownership of raw materials, technology, property rights, and products. So, people is asking, well, we are doing a project, uh, 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 doing public investment or public research, and then private pro profit. So, how to deal with this issue? And then also other issues, related issues uh, related to investment risk, liabilities, different liabilities for public or pub, uh, private uh, companies. And also what about new legisl or legislation adapted to new products? For instance, the product, uh, new legislation for Caumera products. So this is one of the main issues uh, raising nowadays. For instance, here is the people is asking, who owns the sludge from wastewater treatment plants? So now that the sludge is a source of uh, materials, so people is starting to ask who is the owner of this sludge. Then a uh, second big issue is the availability of new water resources. There is a discussion about what happens if we are providing or supplying, uh, or we have new water sources, uh, for instance, in the case of seawater desalination, uh, where the water is, uh, the, the use of the desalinated water will be agriculture. So people is asking what happened if agriculture ex expands with these new water sources, and then we won't be able to stop using uh, other uh, water sources uh, such as uh, degraded aquifers. So there is this issue of expansion of economic activity due to the new water sources, and the conservation of natural resources. And then there is another issue, the economic environmental benefits and the economic cost. For instance, uh, uh, it is expected that renewable energy sources are one mean to for climate change mitigation, but this sort of technology has high invest, investment costs. So the issue is, the question is who pays you know, these, uh, these, these higher investment costs? Cost. And there is also a discussion about zero liquid discharge or minimum liquid discharge. So people is asking or proposing what to do to apply the polluters pay principle or to subsidy uh, or to apply subsidies for clean, clean production. So we are in this uh, uh, stage, we are discussing these issues and we are also proposing some design propositions to the case studies. So some conclusions. Uh, as I said before, the value sensitive design is aimed at incorporating the social values in the process of technological design, development, and implementation. Uh, it is done through an iterative process of stakeholders' con consultation and feedback, and also technical work. Uh, these design and optimization propositions are the main outcome of this process, but as I said before, some policy and market recommendations also emerge from the process of a stakeholder consultation, which is very interesting. And then the expected outcome of the project is to really uh, incorporate these uh, values in technological development, but also to develop a sort of a good practice for stakeholder engagement. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much. And, uh, and thank you for, uh, for being back. Yes, we now have uh, still no questions from uh, the audience yes there is a question to gonzalo uh, from uh, Carilia. could you elaborate a bit more about the methodology used for identifying the values of society okay so what we've done first is to even well we did a stakeholder mapping so each case study map uh, made the the different sort of stakeholders we provide a guidelines for stakeholder identification and mapping to incorporate different sort of uh, stakeholders. Then we choose some key informants. We did some interviews, in-depth interviews with these uh, key informants. Uh, so, so to have a preliminary set of values, uh, we analyzed these interviews. We did a text analysis, a content analysis of the interview, transcribe and analyze the, the interviews. Uh, and then we discuss these uh, values with case study partners. And 
by means of this iteration of uh, identifying uh, values and then uh, discussing with the stakeholders, with case studies, we get the a first, let's say, report. And then this report, we present the outcomes to the communities of practice. Then this meeting, uh, to this meeting, we invite different sort of uh, stakeholders that not only the five, six stakeholders we interview, but for instance, there were some community of practice with 20, 25, 30 stakeholders. So there we split them in different groups and discuss. No, uh, we ask them to validate uh, and to complement the values identified in the previous process. So we are building no, uh, over the time the this set of values from different point of view. Hopefully, yes, and you do that for the different case studies, of course, in the different locations. Yes. Well, thank you very much. I will now give the word to uh, to Hein Koppen. Hein, was it easy to follow everything? I'm sorry about the quality of the video in the beginning, but uh, the presentations, I think, were very crisp. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and, and, and for the opportunity to be here in such distinguished uh, a company. It's uh, actually an exquisite honor to be part of this. Um, it was a little bit difficult to follow because I have my phone uh, uh, for the interactive part, but then I started with my laptop and then I was able to follow it a lot better. And um, I was asked to reflect a little bit about what was presented and how would that uh, apply to the Brazilian reality. Uh, so my name is Hank and I'm a senior economic policy advisor at the Dutch consulate in Sao Paulo. Uh, right now I'm focusing a little bit more on water because because we have new um, developments that are quite interesting. Brazil right now has half of its population, and that is 100 million people who do not have a proper sanitation. Uh, but they might have an outhouse at best, and 35 million people who don't, don't have access to drinking water. And it's a traditional Brazilian paradox because 15% of the world's drinking water is in Brazil, uh, in its rivers or in the Guarani aquifer in the middle of Brazil, and yet, so many people have to suffer from uh, such a basic need that is not uh, fulfilled by uh, well, anybody. Government's not looking at it, private companies also not. It's uh, European pressure that makes uh, industries become a little bit more clean. And um, when you think about the distribution and, and about the technicalities of it, and what about Gonzalo just uh, presented, it made me think of a presentation from the former uh, governor of the Bank of England, who said that as society develops more in economical thinking, um, we lose, we know the price of everything, but we know the value of nothing. Which is um, uh, uh, quite precise here in what Gonzalo said as well. And, and reflecting upon the rest of the presentations, it's um, such a complex issue if you think about the technicalities of it, but we can forget how complex it is socially. And uh, more specific about the Brazilian situation that we have, the 100 million people without access to sanitation, there's a new law. Uh, which privatizes all the water companies, and it's a welcome development. We see about 130 billion euros invested uh, in the next um, 10 years. We see great opportunity for technical developments, and we see great opportunity for uh, dialogue between um, well, companies who would offer the solutions and society who would benefit from it. And every presentation that I saw today, and I'm sure that all the presentations that I'll see at the Amsterdam International Water Week of this year, um, are going to be relevant for what we can do in Brazil. And um, also for the rest of the world, we are always available at the consulates and the embassies to uh, help Dutch companies or Dutch researchers or any other development that might uh, lead to a cooperation between uh, our country, in this case, Brazil, and uh, you uh, in the Netherlands. Thank you again for the opportunity. Well, thank you, uh, Hein, uh, for uh, your reflection. Uh, I happen to know that uh, that we are keen to collaborate, at least at CU Delft, but also uh, together with the other partners uh, with Brazil. The uh, one of your ministers is well, one of the Brazil ministers is coming over to the Netherlands very soon, and uh, we will have a meeting. But while we speak, we are also organizing one of those demo units to be sent over to Brazil. 
uh, from for desalination and membrane technology uh, unit, so that may help. And I know that uh, Royal Haskoning DAV, uh, which is uh, very involved in the Nereda technology, as uh, as uh, Philip explained, is also well uh, rolling out 16 plants with Baker Air in in Brazil to uh, to also implement the Nereda technology. And it will be very interesting to see how that technology could be. Um, indeed used in in brazil because it's different temperature it's different type of wastewater and uh and therefore there's different issues so uh, i mean it's also very interesting for us then as a community to see how that works and how we can do research on that and and that example is of course not only interesting for brazil but also for india for china for everywhere in the world where we speak where there is a uh, uh, everywhere a pressure on on uh, clean water on uh, on cleaning water and to on recovering of materials so um, it's really nice that uh, that you have uh, been able to uh, to join our uh, platform I was looking at the Q&A and I don't see any questions but please do ask questions if you have one if you have not uh, a question right away I will put uh, my email here in the chat so you can send any questions uh, later uh, when you think about it or when you have something that you cannot ask uh, here anymore because in three minutes this uh, this presentation uh, forum will close and uh, there will be another forum in uh, the Amsterdam International Water Week. Uh, so I hope that, uh, that you have enjoyed uh, everything that has been discussed here. Uh, is there one of the panel members who would like to reflect on, uh, on what um, uh, Mr. Kuppen has said? Gonzalo, do you think it's possible to translate your society uh, program to the um, to the Brazil situation? I think the incorporating social values in technological development is not a well. All the even uh, the steps for identifying stakeholder stakeholder values is not a those are the methodologies applied in sociology whiteboard so i think that's not the problem then the issue is how to create the environment for to discuss these issues between the engineers and sociologists no to or sociologists or to combine these different fields and also how to incorporate the the view of different social uh, social sectors, social actors in the te technological development. That is, uh, I think, is the more challenging issue. And we are uh, exploring, analyzing, understanding how to do this process, because I think this is the most difficult part. The oh, issue yes. related to identification of social values is, we, as I said before, we use uh, usual uh, sociologies sociological methods but the issue is how to uh, how to discuss or interact between different fields mm -hmm. so those this is more difficult thank you and uh, philip you were talking about your container uh, that is now shipped from in well in the course of the project from utrecht to faro could that also ship to brazil if uh, if brazilian uh, in, in partners are interested in that sure why not um oh. would be exciting to uh, to analyze a sample maybe first from uh, from one of these brazilian uh, wastewater treatment plants but in principle uh, it would be uh, yeah that's why we are building this this containerized unit eh? okay we excellent. should well, it also beyond the water mining to other countries absolutely that's the aim of water mining as well so so um I hope that uh, that we can then contact you in case there is this and that you can know now who to contact in case you have questions with your partners. And uh, I thank you all uh, for joining this session, for giving the presentations, big applause for all the speakers. And also thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kuppen, for joining us and giving you feedback from the other sides of the world in uh, Latin America. Thank you all and see you soon in the next session.
<laughs> bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much to bye. all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you all.